members, that concludes oral questions and ministers of development. We now move to topical questions uh, to the minister. Trevor Lunn. Mr Lunn. Yes, thank you. Mr Speaker, uh, the, the minister was severely critical last week of the sentence handed down by the courts to Thomas Beresford, the loyalist bandsman. Can I ask him how he reconciles that criticism with... Order, order, order. I, I, I did already warn the House that topical questions should be questions that very much is the responsibility of the Minister within his department. Now, I'm prepared to let the member finish uh, because sometimes uh, supplementary questions and questions, they grow legs. So I'll allow the member to finish. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the rest of the question was, how does he, the minister reconcile his criticism of that sentence with his obligation under the Pledge of Office to support the police and the court and to uphold the rule of law? Um, I'm sure that there will be some reflection afterwards as to whether questions of this format are, are uh, appropriate or not and I'm sure that the Speaker in due course will want to consider that. However, I'll just make two points to the member. First of all, I spoke on that occasion very clearly as a local representative and representing the interests of uh, people from uh, the community. And secondly, I did say in the course of the statement, if the member had actually read it all, that there should be respect for law. That was clearly stated. My comment was purely on the extent of the uh, punishment that was handed out to the individual in the context of this being the very first instance where someone had been uh, brought before the courts and then uh, sent to prison uh, for a period of months for playing uh, a piece of music. Trevor Long, Mr Long. Yeah, well, I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, he, he was critical of the, the court's decision and he can hardly divorce himself from being a minister when it suits him in these situations. Now, the supplementary has given his intention to crack down on benefit fraud. How does he expect to be taken seriously when he can be so selective in his support for court decisions and his adherence to the Pledge of Office? The Department of Social Development deals with a lot of very complex and difficult issues. Issues that matter a lot to people. Issues about housing, welfare, community regeneration, addressing dereliction, addressing town centre regeneration. And I'm disappointed that the member was unable to find anything within that totally broad remit about which to ask a question. I would take his question more seriously if I had seen a pattern from him of challenging some other ministers from the other side of the chamber about some of the things that they've done, because I've never heard him do it yet. Stephen Mutry. Mr. Mutry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, can he outline the investment to date since he came into office for public realm works by his own department and towns and city centres across Northern Ireland? I thank the member for the question, which is one of the very central areas of work that my department undertakes and one which is highly valued by local communities, by councils, by traders and by residents. Because improving the public realm in a town or city is a fundamental part of any regeneration program. And during my time in office, I've approved funding of £66 million for 177 public realm schemes across Northern Ireland. For example, some schemes have been completed in Belfast City Centre, Phase 1, £28 million. Port Rush Station Square, £1.3 million. Lurgan Town Centre, £1.8 million. And Queen's Quay in Londonderry, £688,000. And those schemes have involved making improvements to the pavements, to the roadways, the street lighting, the furniture and public art. All of the schemes have been widely welcomed by the local community, by local residents, by visitors to the towns and cities and the local traders because they've had a positive social and economic impact uh, in those particular areas. Uh, I thank the Minister for his response and would he agree with me that the financial investment that he makes in our town and city centres, not least of all the difference that has been made in my own town centre in Lurgan, is beneficial to the communities and it makes them a more attractive place for people to come and shop. Um, the members focused the issue very much in relation to trailers there and 
It is true that over the past five years, local traders right across the province and indeed right across the United Kingdom and further afield have faced difficult trading conditions. However, the investment that the Department has made to transform town and city centres has helped to support businesses and indeed improve the vibrancy and the footfall in towns and cities. Uh, when you create attractive, open and shared places, that is one of the best ways to encourage families to return to them and spend more time in our high streets. There are other things that are drawing people away from town centres, whether it be internet shopping or out of town centres. This is work that helps to draw people back in and to sustain the town centres. Portadown and Durgan have seen on average a 34 per cent increase in footfall. Belfast has experienced a 55 per cent increase and Newcastle experienced a phenomenal increase of nearly 300 per cent. That increase in footfall has also led to an improvement in business confidence. For example, the Belfast Streets Ahead scheme resulted in private sector investment on 20 refurbishments of premises and 64 new businesses opening in the area. Work to progress new schemes in partnership with Council in towns such as Ballymena, Belfast Bank Square, Bangor and Newton Ards are well advanced, as everyone has seen that investing in our public realm really does help to make our towns much more family friendly and thereby supports uh, the town centre and the traders therein. Thank you. Lynch. Yes, sir, Lynch. I get to Callan Collier. I know the Minister mentioned during question time that he had been struck last week to look at Order, homes. Can, can I apologise to the member? I have sort of jumped to his question uh, far too soon. <laughs> David Hillage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, having reached the last question time of the year, can I ask the Minister if he believes that the Welfare Reform Bill uh, will have made any progress before the end of the year, uh, considering the government deadline of the new year, when they have said that the, the uh, devolved situation here will have to face bills of £5 million per month? Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for that question because it is appropriate that at this uh, final question time of 2013 we have this item on the agenda. The member will be well aware, indeed other members are, that I have been working extensively with executive colleagues to progress the Welfare Reform Bill through the Assembly and indeed to achieve the best possible outcome for the citizens of Northern Ireland. Um, at the last uh, meeting of uh, the executive, it was agreed to reconvene the Executive Subcommittee on Welfare Reform, uh, and a meeting of that subcommittee has now been scheduled for next Monday, uh, the 16th of December. Um, it really is a one-item agenda. Um, I don't know what else there will be on the agenda other than one item, and that is how do we move this forward. Um, I would certainly have hoped that we would have made swifter progress. Um, I hope that we can make progress after that meeting next Monday. But given the Christmas recess, the earliest that any bill can be brought back to the Executive for decision would be the 16th of January. And if we meet that deadline, uh, then I could expect the bill to receive royal assent by the end of March or early April. But since, as you have rightly pointed out, um, the um, message clearly from Westminster, from uh, the Department for Work and Pensions, the Secretary of State and the Treasurer has been that if we miss the January deadline, then the penalties of approximately £5 million pounds per month will kick in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and welcome the, the answer from the Minister. And perhaps he would give us another message. And dare I ask how he feels, uh, is this a good use of the limited block grant that we receive? The one word answer to that would be no. It is not a good use of our limited block grant. Um, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury has written to the Finance Minister highlighting his concerns about the delay in the Welfare Reform Bill uh, for Northern Ireland and indicating that the UK Government can make adjustments to the Northern Ireland Block Grant for the additional cost of the Exchequer for AME spending controls which are not achieved. Treasury have estimated the cost to be around £5 million per month since April 2013, £50 to £60 million by January 2014 and well over £200 million a year by 2017-18. The Chief Secretary has stated clearly, categorically, that it will be necessary to make Dell, uh, begin to make Dell adjustments unless the reforms are implemented by January 2014. And the fact of the matter is this. 
When you start taking five and then 60 and up to 200 million pounds a year off the block grant, that cuts into the money that other departments have to spend, because it's not going to be coming off my budget. Every department will be affected here. And that means an impact on classrooms, on teachers, on schools, on hospitals, on nurses, on social services, on operations, whatever it is, right across the realm of health and education, there is a significant impact. And people should get that very clearly in their minds. This is not some thing that's uh, just out there floating about in the ether. This is a reality. And it's important that people grasp that and therefore that the nettle is grasped and that we deal with this issue as a matter of urgency. We've got a very good package of measures that I've been able to negotiate with Westminster and also through discussions with OFM, DFM. We need to get those out there for open discussion. That's what the community widely wants. It's been acknowledged by the uh, Voluntary Community Centre. Nick made that very clear. Others have said it to us. We Minister's need to be in a position to move forward on this. Now Sean Lynch. Where am I? I'll get uh, uh, last, or can call you. As I said earlier, the Minister mentioned in question time that he had been struck guard, I think, last week, looking at homes with poor or no insulation. And he particularly mentioned houses with uh, concrete skin or no cavity walls. Could I ask the Minister what he has learned uh, from his visit and uh, could it be useful for our own circumstances here? Um, I find it very informative indeed um, to, to see the, the difference that it made in the energy efficiency of the properties that we visited. They were retrofitting properties that quite a lot of them had been built in the 60s. They were 60s, early 70s. They were around 40 years old. Um, they were being very substantially retrofitted with a very high level of insulation. Um, there are other things that follow on. If you insulate, there are other things you must do to make sure that the house functions properly. But uh, there are good practical examples there of what can be done. I mentioned already this afternoon the pilot work going ahead there at Spring Farm in Antrim, which will benefit not only Northern Ireland but the whole of the United Kingdom. This is an issue that should have been addressed some years ago because this sort of work has been ongoing in uh, GB for some time, certainly been underway on the continent for quite a long time, and they're dealing with much more colder conditions than we would have here in Northern Ireland. Um, the extent of the insulation, I thought, was very significant. Um, the, the way in which they build properties, again, there were lessons to be learned there, and I'm pleased that we had with us people from the Construction Industry Training Board, people from the Master Builders Association and from the Housing Executive because there are connections being developed there between experts in Northern Ireland and experts in Germany. We can learn from each other and I think uh, they can gain some ways from us, we can gain from them. We certainly uh, want to see this done. As I say, it should have been done a long time ago because it is not right that people should be uh, left languishing in properties that are cold uh, and damp. Sean Lynch. I have that uh, can call you. I'm going great this session area and ask some fragments. And I want to thank them, the Minister, for his uh, fairly elaborate uh, and comprehensive answer. But uh, I would ask the Minister, he is aware that there are houses and homes in this part of the country which have poor insulation. And I would ask the Minister what measures he's going to put in place, uh, particularly there are some even relatively new homes, social houses, and houses like Mount Erigel's, which is in Poldas which have seen their homes deteriorate as a result recently. I suppose there are three elements to this. The first is the technology, and that's what I've spoken about so far. Um, and I think there's a clear idea on, on the way that that should be taken forward. There was some work done retrofitting houses previously, for example, by putting an inner skin on some walls, which didn't work. Uh, they, they, the effect of it lasted for maybe a year or two, but it wasn't a long-lasting effect. So we need to get the right technology. Secondly, there's the issue of social housing and then the issue of private owners. Um, the issue of social housing, um, we've made that a, a target for the housing executive, and that's why they're involved in all of these schemes. Um, that's why um, they are, are measuring the energy efficiency of their properties at the moment, uh, something I referred to earlier, uh, so that they know the type of properties, some of them are no finds, some of them are solid old stone walls. There are even some Orlet properties and um, old corrugated bungalows. So the, we need to get the issue of social housing dealt with. There's also then that uh, more complex issue around the private owner and uh, what can be done to support them. 
And that is something that will have to be taken through, um, not just the technology, but how that might be supported in some way and what sort of business case might be constructed around that. Order members, time is up. Um.